You're on. Yay. It's kind of hard to sing songs in times like these. Oh, um, that's a sad oh, fucking song, man. isn't it? Songs oh are so powerful. Um, uh, uh, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> well, we've missed a few others. I haven't sung a song for every single episode. That's true, but we've never talked about that you're not singing a that's song happening. while it's not happening. Yeah. But that's okay because, <laughs> in a way, what you do is a piece at the beginning, a spontaneous piece, and you just did one. Yeah. It well, was heartfelt. It was poetic. Thanks for know. letting me get the first word. Um, yeah. Yeah. Man, it's, it's, uh, it is. It's, I think it's gotten. There were 800 deaths in New York today. Damn. And I think... Or yesterday. What, how many in the country? Like, I'm well, say, a thousand. I know that much. For oh, in the country? Context, yeah, today? Yeah. It's so yeah. bizarre to me that that is not surprising. Um, no. Like, in historic... Like, think at some point in 20, 30 years or something, somebody finds just this episode... And we start by like probably nonchalantly mentioning yeah. that 800 people died in New York today with no context of why. And all three of us are just like, oh, bummer. But yeah. Uh-huh. Right? right. Like, how fucked up is that as a moment in time in 2020 that that is kind of like not news? Right. You're right. Well, uh, and and to that end, uh, just for analysis of the psychological impact of some of this stuff, for just you know the sake of exercise, it's like if I don't want to compare it to something like D Day, right? Because it's not like that. But there are certain things that a human being doesn't normally have to think, and and basically as far as I know, any modern times and well before, like usually you don't think it's like a 50, 50 chance that I'm going to die of this thing that's happening, you know, like around the world. Like in the reason I'm just saying D day is like getting off those landing craft and onto the beach. It's like, Jesus Christ, you had to be like, fuck, you know, be a miracle if I survive this shit. Uh, this doesn't feel like it'll be a miracle if I survive it, but it's sustained. It's lasting for a really long time. If you fuck up just a little bit, you or your loved ones might end up having a horrible death, you know, and yeah. every human has to like come to terms with the fact that <clears throat> it could be nothing to us or we could shrivel up and die uh, within a few weeks and that could be triggered <clears throat> already or yeah. uh later and that's just on everybody's dome like yeah no do i already have it is on everybody's mind all the time and also just even if i don't have it will i not get it like there's just a type of mortality or like more i don't know what to call yeah. that yeah we're all Morbid. gonna get it it's morbidity yeah 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 more, yeah uh, like in inevitability to the morbidness of like of and i think a lot of people are having to deal with mortality in a way that's a little more um, confrontive right now. And yeah. I kind of think that that lends its space for speaking of spirituality a little more um, and talking to, I think a lot of the people that are now going to be interacting with the idea of their own mortality or the mortality of people that they care about are people that if, you know, have a lot of people have moved away from organized religion in the last half a century. Uh huh. And so those people won't have that more typical standardized sort of resource to fall back on as far as a faith based answer to mortality. And yeah, um, <clears throat> but I think it's like it's so defining what the fact that life ends, it, it makes humans what we are. We have this one shot. We have this one families and one communities and like it's all the more valuable because of that. And I think a lot of people are trying to figure out how to navigate their own personal spirituality right now and yeah. find the find, find, find meaningfulness in this. Well, know? it's interesting um, because it's certainly to me lends itself at least in some ways to the concept of like more of a hive uh, mentality anyway, yeah, uh, sure. because it's something that to be responsible and care you know, like 
as another person, you're supposed to take cer certain steps for the better of everyone, not just yourself, right? Yeah. Um, and everyone's being asked to do that basically around the world. And then they're showing, hey, there's benefits to that. So I could see how in the void of spirituality or religion, uh, people could be seeing in real time certain things that are working and being open to lifestyles or schools of thought based around that stuff, you know, and that's why I'm saying like the hive thing is like, okay, what can we accomplish together? Um, how do we grapple with the fact that any one of us might go at any time, but we're trying to all survive. But then also I was thinking like, uh, it's just, it seems like we're an organism like many others, you know, um, and we don't want to die and we want to do, you know, like a lot of those principles aren't human exclusive. A lot of animals and whatever are like that. Um, but I think to an extent we struggle with like the idea of our own individuality within it and how like, well, it can't make sense that we're just one, the equivalent of a cell or a star in the universe. We're just like insignificant, people say, you know, the term insignificant, like the mortality of it all and or like the fleetingness of of life and all that it's hard for people to think oh well i was just like a cell in a greater body of something else for example you know but yeah. but maybe that's just all we are you know and then every creature every being is designed to make a reality for itself out of its existence that works that makes sense you know and all this is is basically the bio matrix. I don't yeah. Know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, there's no question that we base, we inform ourselves with our own, our own delusions um, left and right. So you're right in that. Um, man. Yeah. There's so many factors that kind of go into, into that. It, 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 interestingly, I, I like the idea that what you're talking about, like this, the hive, I, I, I like that. And I think that there can be even some ways to create soulless, in a new digital age with that in mind. Um, and I get to that, but I think that, that death is also this thing that is, um, yeah, we can have a family member pass away and, and it hurts. And one of the ways, you know, like it hurts and it hurts in like a multitude of ways, sorry, but it hurts because anybody that passes away that, you know, it is a reminder of your own mortality. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're not you're going to lose that person now and you will be lost to others in the future. And that whole like the selfishness of that is as deep as that is, is because it's this individual journey. Like like, like death is the thing that we really do alone. I think a, a lot of people f feel that way. And I was wondering what if we what if you have like this uh, an eternal mausoleum, digital mausoleum? that um people who are you know you can create basically your archive for your family in perpetuity to be able to access or anybody in perpetuity to be able to access and be like this is the life of bjorn you know born in 81 died in 2065 cross my fucking fingers um <laughs> uh knock on wood um like he did he you know liked music and made these you know, pieces of music he wanted to share with you and, you know, did this podcast with his friends. Here's two episodes he thought were hot. You know what I mean? Like have that and and share that sort of a thing in a place that speaks to that. And anybody can go share it. You can go walk up and see Johnny Smith's thing and like see what he wanted to share with the world posthumously. But it's uh, physical or is it all just online? I, th I think it's digital. D online digital or like, I mean... I don't know. Local be, digital, like, like, do you go to a place to access this, the or can you access it from anywhere? The idea just kind of came to me, so I don't know. I think you're I think working on that universal. with the uh, focus group. Focus yeah, group you guys are We're my focus, focus group. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah what I mean, if they I, told you? I, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, what if they told you now you got to wear a cape to be in the mausoleum? Public. No, in public. Oh, I would wear like, a cape. If they were like, for your safety, we're, we're, we are now recommending you have, that. 
Americans wear capes. Yeah, when Americans I, wear capes when they're outside of the home. Does that make sense, though? <laughs> What, not exactly, the, but I thought it'd be fun. Is it a special cape? Is it like a? Is it like an invisibility cloak? Uh, no, Back just we found the proof? the virus is uh, averse to capes. The virus general. is any allergic cape, to capes. Any cape doesn't have to be. If you can get a proper cape, it'd be great. But if you can yeah. just put a towel around your neck, that'd work too. So the Better spectrum is like Dracula to super. <laughs> uh, to child with a blankie over her shoulder. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Got it. I like I'm just that. saying that would be an if interesting world. I think we should try it just in case. I'm I think we, yeah. should, we should wear capes just in case. Oh, there's and the say, religion. If somebody, if somebody asks you, and, and you know, like, why are you wearing a cape? You can say, you don't know it doesn't help. That's a fair point, first of all. <laughs> Secondly, Buren said people are looking for the spirituality. So we could probably start like a cult slash religion thing with capes and masks. And it would all about all, be all about avoiding uh, like microbes and whatnot. I was gonna say like capist doesn't have a good ring to it. What doesn't the capist? Capist. capist. Uh, For the capists, um, the capists. We'll, we'll, we'll focus group that one too. Yeah, that sounds like um, higher, so higher some stuff. Do. Yeah, I, I like speaking of religion. I where my mind went was, I, um, what if? Uh, w- the new like evolution of religion is the religion of isolation. Um, the history of religion has been mostly a religion of community, uh, mostly a tradition of community of gathering together. And uh, it's, you know, um, tribalism in a lot of ways. Um, if people, because of viruses and the new norm become isolated um, and become not necessarily quarantine all the time, but the sort of default state um, is less of a social butterfly and more of a hermit for general society. What if the new religion that spawns out of that, or maybe an old religion that evolves from that is based on that isolation is all about like meditation, inner thought, introspection, quiet time, like all of the stuff that you do alone. And it's not necessarily a religion that's focused on community and outreach and et cetera, et cetera. A religion of the mind, you know, a religion that's like, that's based on the assumption that you're going to spend most of your time in isolation. Uh, what yeah. would that yeah. Like, is there a religion that already exists is where my mind went that that kind of serves that need like Buddhists um, and, you know, Trappist monks. And, you know, there's a lot of like um, isolation in in those types of, you know, in those types of teachings. Um, But I I wonder if that's the kind of thing that could evolve, like that could catch on, that could that could be the kernel of a new like kind of global superpower religion. You know uh, what I mean? Yeah, or interesting. By, by the nature of it being isolated, could it not be a superpower religion? You know, no, is, I mean, the, is the it, force of religion the community factor? Well, the bottom line is these days it doesn't matter. You don't have to be together anyway. You wouldn't have had to. You could build big online communities and movements already. Um, and now it's only more possible. Maybe that's temporary, but it's the case. So... I feel pretty confident uh, you could easily create something or someone could create something based around people's isolation uh, in particular now. Um, You know what I mean? Because a lot of those online communities, like they would say, it's like the people who would have never found each other. Like they didn't know, Mm, oh, there's other people like this or whatever i don't know whatever their special differences or what they're finding each other doing but Mm. yeah yeah um can we can we take just a quick moment here oh and they just stopped too but you can hear the frogs coming through on meshack's end oh yeah i heard yeah i've got the window a little open and they're from the still oh they keep cutting in and out i love how uniform one of the things i love about frogs um is the hive functionality of their calling um they a group of it seems like a thousand of them or whatever will be in a pond 
And all of a sudden, you know, Doug is like, stop. And everybody just fucking stops on the phone. I know, right? Okay. <laughs> and then Ian will be like, start. And everybody's like right back yep. fucking doing it like hard. You know what I mean? But I know, um, it's like Wayne and Garth like car. Game <laughs> yeah. on. <laughs> yeah. And anyways, it's um I think the isolation we've already moved into a society that's promoted isolation in a lot of ways. I mean, the way that we geographically design our urban areas tends to lend to people being able to self-isolate and choosing to do so often. Um, they interact in other digital media often, but some people are, I think, I, th I think in some ways our society has just really transformed over the last few decades about how we view community. Um, yeah. and it doesn't have to be the people who hang out and have, church you know coffee together on sundays that's mm -hmm. that's not community for a lot of people um so i think i think you're hitting it right on the head but i think people still want like the sense of belonging and um and, and being a part of something i think is still really important mm -hmm. to people uh i think you'd see with that version of spirituality like everybody kind of being on their own like a lot of brand new like archangels created symbology of like brand like brand new right. geometric relationships to sound people would get into cymax that's the shit that i'm like i think tone shape color all of that has this like connectivity and that's the real like building block glue of the universe has has this like it's this other state that's kind of beyond the way that we think of our three dimensions forming, but sound and shape are big governors of form. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we're, I think to me, that's what like boiling it down to elemental science. It looks a lot like when you change the, you know, frequency on a, in a climatic experience and change the way that the sand sits on the plate. Mm -hmm. um, that's like God shit. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. It's the stuff that oh. makes me think of. You know what that level. that made me think about? What if this new whatever religion was basically the culmination of the concept of science being either in competition with or exclusive to religion, you know? Um, and so where, because a lot of people are going to go, shit, man, scientists be saying uh, viruses could get us and then they got us. You know, scientists said that the global climate was going to be changing and right. everyone didn't believe them. All of us were like, oh, no, scientists, whatever. But then, you so know, I feel like a lot of people are ready to see scientists as like a, a type of prophets and you could probably use that. Um, we got to go back know? to our genius trading cards idea, man. Uh, genius yeah, trading well, cards. We need to make heroes out of scientists. Does someone have breaking news? Uh, Meshach's uh, always got breaking my, news. I know. My phone, <laughs> it's so ridiculous, man. I got, okay, I'm going to mute my phone. Um, but it's, okay. if you know the ESPN First, uh, breaking yeah. news yeah. sound, that bad da 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 It's ESPN. So it's really fucking earth-shakingly important. It's, it's very, very ESPN. important. Yeah. yeah. But let me tell you who you need to get onto this new age spirituality to support scientists and like a scientific spirituality cardi b mm -hmm. scientists she is such a cool great person like i i just love everything that like she says yeah it's <laughs> pretty great so so i feel like if she was your fucking main like like promoter like you also you were know, trying scientists. to get her to be the vice president yeah like, a couple I, weeks ago on this show. i love promoting cardi, cardi b for everything yeah <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel you though, and I appreciate your appreciation for her. Yeah. Uh, and I think um, she could be an asset to the whole thing. No question. Speaking of um, speaking of vice presidents, uh, Bernie. Oh, B. Sanders Bernie is out today. Yeah. Did you hear about that? Like, yeah, it feels there were, like there were tears in this home. It's yeah, rough. Like I, I honestly like. I, it wasn't, I didn't think about it. I was, I actually got in the truck, Bjorn, and I was going to get some gas and turn on the radio and NPR yeah. uh, announced it. And like, I had a moment of just like sitting at the end of the driveway and like caught myself just sitting there. I don't yeah. know how long. I'm just like, what? Wait, what? So yeah, that's he was okay. 
So like in the middle of this, we have to vote for Joe Biden. Well, that's yeah. that's the like. I don't gotta do shit, do I? Well, <laughs> otherwise, well, oh, true. one sexual assaulter versus another. Well, that's right. my oh, choice. I don't know but, if it's that simple. I mean, one guy who will literally get millions of people killed uh, by his own arrogance and stupidity versus one who probably won't get. I mean, it's kind of say, almost down to that. I, the now. way I see Joe, Joe Biden at that this that point, people. if Joe Biden got elected in the middle of this pandemic, he would be a sacrificial lamb for the greater good. He would be four years, if that, and he'd be replaced. Fine. But that's four years that we would not have Trump. Period. Yeah, well, we, he's really fucked this up, Trump. That's the thing. Like, this, this situation in America is, like, fathoms worse, worse than it would be without that type of stupidity and arrogance, you know? Um, and so if he's still there and something else happens, expect this, you know, no matter what he handles, it's going to be botched. So I don't love Joe Biden in any way, but, I mean, I don't even think they're on the same scale of type of destruction. Yeah. Trump is destruction. Yeah. Like, he's like he's like asking earth, nature, God, every being and fate and you know, luck tradition to just give every you know, like, oh, we're so cocky, we're electing this guy and letting him be our president. Like what do we expect but fucking viruses and all this other shit? Earth I'm, is like, like I can't handle I, this. I, when I when I what I was thinking when I paused and like sat in the truck was what was going through Bernie's mind when he made the decision. <clears throat> and <clears throat> I have to imagine that part of it obviously would have been just the math uh, equation, right? The money and votes and et cetera. But another part would have to be the current situation for the world and for the country and for himself and et cetera. Um, and his calculus must have included the potential that in the middle of this and the trajectory of the way that the election of the campaign is going, the Democratic Party is facing a split. And the longer that Bernie versus Biden goes into the uh, convention, <clears throat> the more split the Democratic Party is going to be. And in the middle of this, Donald Trump is still president in a, during a global pandemic. And in the same way that Bloomberg backed out in 2016 because he didn't want to split the vote and between Hillary and Trump, I think Bernie must have done the calculus to say the only way that Donald Trump has any chance of getting out of the office now is if I get out of the race and everybody puts all of their force behind any fucking body else but Donald Trump. But like that's and that sort of sort of soothes it for me. So, like sort of make makes me feel better, but like it doesn't because number one, I don't think that's gonna work. I think Donald Trump is still gonna win. And number two even if it does, to exactly the point that we've all just made pretty clearly emotionally, Joe Biden is a terrible fucking option. And after 2016, after Bernie's entire career, after this fucktard in the White House, and then this campaign during the fucking global pandemic, for Bernie to then just stop... Without that calculus in mind, feels like such a fucking rug being pulled out. You know, it feels like such a floor well, dropping in the middle. No, of everybody's this. got the. I mean, I clear, clearly those are all points that move through his camp and that he spoke to and thought about and considered. I don't. I don't think there's any doubt about that. I think that. Um, I think that a big factor was the fact that the convention was going to be pushed back again. You know, you're looking at like this August date, even tentatively now, and 
if there was hope, it was going to be that there was like some rallying cry at a convention. The convention's timeline versus when the actual election would going to be would give whoever came out of it alive still that much more time to like create their base and fight for it. But now the convention's back, you know, another month, month and a half into August. It's given you, you know, two and change months to get your act together and scramble against Trump in order for the federal election to take place if it does uh, in November. And and I think I think chronology is a huge factor. And I think you brought that up, Meshach, and that's exactly what we're dealing with. And if if there's a year that I ever do vote for Biden, it will be the year that coronavirus has swarmed the planet and forced me into a black place where I once again have to choose somebody who I don't really want to be president. Um, but I feel like maybe maybe I've been swindled a little bit by the idea of Bernie into thinking that I we deserve a candidate who actually we do want to elect because that's the first person. And, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, we were excited for Obama, but, you know, he Bernie's policies are what we want in in charge. That's who we want in the executive branch. And um we haven't had somebody like that in, in my lifetime, somebody who really spoke to and was going to create a new progressive mm-hmm. model in policy um, rather than just verbatim. Um, well, and like, you know, we've talked about it on the uh, on this cast several times that like to a degree it boils down to the person I want to vote for, like the person I believe in, the person I trust, you know, et cetera. But then we also have a, a thread on this cast of boycott the parties Mm -hmm. because the system is broken and the, and the system is broken is a, is a phrase that is said across the political spectrum, right? Across the partisan spectrum, people are screaming, the system is broken. Well, how do we fix the system unless we elect people into this system who will change it? Yeah. Um, like unless we're planning for a civil war in this country, then the way to change the system is to elect candidates who would fit into the current system and who can and will change it. Yeah. Um, and Bernie is literally the only candidate I can remember in my lifetime. The promise of Obama aside, mm-hmm. the promise of Bernie is that he'll change the system that it's yeah. not just a guy that I do trust and I do respect and I do want to vote for, but he's also a guy who has been campaigning on this system is broken. Yeah. Well, and he's been living that message in every way for a long time. Um, yeah. And it's, it's unfortunate. Uh, it's not a huge surprise to me, although I was just thinking it would be interesting. Like if you worked for him, for example, uh, if you were one of his advisors and you were, let's say, last week or the week before having this discussion, are we going to drop out? Are we going to stay in? What's the strategy? What's the math? All that. Like what ideas um, might have been tossed around the table? You know, it's kind of fun right. to think about that because uh, I was just trying to think of some. At and, what point uh, in that conversation did somebody bring up, could we call Bloomberg and have a conversation? <laughs> somebody before, probably did. Before you yeah. back out of the before you back out of the race, can we just call Mike and see what he says? Like, yeah, well, I mean, because <laughs> on the one hand, uh, it's a bit of a surprise that this, I mean, it's not, people are very, very preoccupied at the end of the day, so it's not a surprise. But progressive policy is more intuitive than ever to your average person um, because it's very clear, you know, just everything is just kind of highlighted with all of this you know he's created the platform for a progressive party yeah and there's and there's a clear i think opening in people's minds to understand progressiveness that there wasn't a month ago so at the table in the sanders campaign two weeks ago you know you had to probably have some people saying hey this is our you know this is a terrible moment but it's our moment because we can totally use this to prove our point so let's go because I had a lot of money and shit, you know, so yeah. it's like, let's let's go and make ads or let's create this thing and, and do it with whatever production we have. Let's think creatively about how to create multimedia shit that 
uh, is going to brand us with these concise and elegant solutions to the problems we have now. You know, there are probably people thinking that. And then there's probably people thinking on like the publicity stunt side of things, like what kind of thing could be done here. Like maybe Bernie should make an announcement that he's running for president of the world. Uh, or so, you know what I mean? Just like ideas like that. I love that idea. Tossed, tossed around by advisors. I just like imagining the fly on the wall, like, you know. I mean, you know, he he is he's at a point where, I mean, first of all, what what do you guys what would you guys put the over under on Bernie ever running for president again? I That'd mean, be eighty two. Yeah. Do you you think it's you think it's yeah. less than twenty percent? Yeah, oh, I'd say, <clears throat> I think I'd say it's, it's less than five right. or less okay. than that. So this was a retirement decision. Um, uh, not necessarily. Not necessarily. I, mean, he's still he's, I would be surprised if he politics. steps away from this. Yeah. Not from politics, but from the presidential aspirations. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. This was a this was a, a pretty final conversation. I bet it was pretty somber. It might have sure. been. Yeah, I bet it was. I bet it was like much more a conversation about passing the mantle, passing the torch, and like what he's going to do to kind of throughout the rest of his career type thing. Like yeah. at least what going in his through his mind. You know, I don't think I don't think this is the that thinking is too far away uh, in his brain. I think he's well aware of his age and everything else, and the fact that <laughs> you know, like. Really? think bernie knows how old he is <laughs> well, it's, just like, <laughs> that it's i i don't know that he i think he was probably a little surprised at how well he did last cycle in 2016 when he ran um especially you know being an older white guy i think the fact that it also <clears throat> caught on him this time to some degree surprised him but i don't think he was going oh so it's a given i'm going to be the president right away or you know, I have like a super long career ahead anyway. I think it's more probably he's I would imagine he's been thinking about what he'll do in either case for a long time. But, yeah, you know, if yeah, I, I, mean, if I probably lose. went into this thinking this is my last chance. Let me give it one last go. No question. Yeah, if I don't. I'm going to make Mitch McConnell's life really hell. I'd like to think that's. Well, I mean, and nothing nothing else just speaking to and like we were saying creating a sense where the progressive values and policies are appreciated and understood by a lot of americans he has done that he has taken that idea set and it's transcended from you know crackpot idea to we could do that we just have to choose to do it you know what i mean like like i think a, there's plenty of americans that still think he's crazy or dis don't like the word socialism created that to brand him but there's a lot of people even you know ozzy and and my mother people who are in their 70s who were very middle of the road democrat mostly wanted clinton etc yeah um they've been swayed by bernie this time around they've finally heard it enough and they've thought about it enough and they've seen the like the passion that a lot of younger people in my generation people who are going to inherit this freaking country and world we're not um, even a young generation though just I, I, jesus sorry i mean but yeah. we will be responsible yeah. for it next yeah, yeah. there you go <laughs> that's we'll the be fact. the old people making the decisions next yeah, yeah. we will yeah. be the we will be the wise old bastards reminding everybody why we're here yeah, yeah. and remember that one time we all had to stay home <laughs> you motherfuckers remember trump you remember yeah. that shit? Yeah. Not doing that be, shit again. <laughs> this ain't bad. bad. Yeah. Hey, the next president should come in and give everybody, every American a medal for putting up with the asshole before him. Oh, God. Like, give him a presidential medal of freedom or something. Well, yeah, because like, Rush Limbaugh got one. So right. every, every American deserves exactly that medal. Right? Mm -hmm. Or a new, cooler one. Um, yeah. What do you think... Let's just say that the world comes back online. Everything, everything goes back to hunky dory mode, you know, ideal utopia like it was before. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What's what's the equivalent product to toilet paper after that transition? The day. 
No, like every American needs to have a fucking bidet. This I know paper bullshit is stupid. But that's already that's associated with the now because when everybody found out they had to stay home, everybody wanted to get toilet paper. When they find out everything's all good, is there any product that either like is it just going to be that toilet paper doesn't sell anymore Uber. and there's just tons of it? It's going to be Uber. I think it's going to be makeup and cars and consume like. Things to make you look good and feel good. It's going to be uh, that industry. Uh, things to things to like a brand new outfit to wear out because you're just going to see all your new friends. You're going to get something new. Yeah, shiny and it's glossy. Gonna be, it's going to be sunshine. Okay. Question, go outside time. Yeah. Question on that though: uh, Is there a timeline on that being likely? So what I mean is, if things got great in two or three months let's say what you just said happens but if it yeah. took a year and a half yeah. would it be the same or would people be the by then conditioned to just be like i cut my own hair yeah, I yeah, yeah, right, right. yeah. well for i mean like function. like would it transform that quickly that's actually yeah. what i was that's kind of um linked to a question i was thinking about what we talked about earlier is that all these people staying home and like being in isolation um, are going to create a bunch of habits around that. They're going to create a bunch, like all their habits and stuff are going to change and their bad habits come up because they don't have structure and whatever. But then you come out to the real world and all your habits from isolation are in place now. So you get a bunch of like cave dwelling hermits coming out to the light for the first time, uh, kind of yeah, for yeah. some time, you know? Yeah. And or yeah, people with who, their... like all their social interactions are like this. They're all digital. So they're right. not used to like, you know, silent moments of like not carrying airtime or whatever. Yeah. You know, Sp- speaking to your trajectory there, Rob, I think for this football season, be- because the NFL is going to cause the next spike, right? When they try to have actual games. They're not going to do that. In September and October. Yeah, they are. They won't. And, and people are going to go. And all of a sudden, everybody's going to fucking be infected. And it, and then the country's going to shut down again, November, December, fourth quarter. Retail brick and mortars over. Um, now, th- there's big economic shit coming down. We got the swing all the way into next spring. So if we're looking at reopening everything for next summer, summer 2021, like you're saying, yeah. a year, year and a half. Yeah. Now, people don't go for cosmetics and new shoes. Right. They go for guns. And fucking seeds and like, right. <laughs> like that land. sort of shit. Like, yeah, land. They're trying exactly. To yeah. People yeah. are moving all over the Midwest. There's like two million people suddenly moved to North Dakota at once. Moving out of cities, moving out of urban areas if you can yeah. afford it. Getting somewhere where you can get some isolation. Detroit becomes like the most populated city in the world, and it's suddenly super walkable and neighborhoody with gardens everywhere. Yeah, Winnebago's and Airstreams. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, it's hard to deny that those could be convenient in apocalyptic circumstances. Yeah, Jeez. let me let me just uh, send a message to to uh, to the whole, com- the whole com- company of Tesla um, and uh, to Elon Musk personally, who I know watches this, uh, this show. Yeah. He's one of the just, bigger commenters on Super Chat. Um, I just made that just, up. We don't have super chat. Just, just We're build us a, enough, yeah. just build us a power solar briefcase with a built-in battery that's portable. Right. I want, I want a briefcase that I pop open. I plug shit in. The lid is solar. I just set it out there. Plug an extension cord to it, and it's running. And it's going to charge a battery. And the whole thing is done, Mister Tesla people. Please just do that at a consumer price. The entire fucking world needs it. Goal Zero has one. It's probably not as good as what a Tesla product would be as far as its efficiency. But you can get... Goal Zero has a lot of products like that. Well, that's cool. Uh, so they're... they're yeah. They vied for this spot with Tesla. And Are he they sh- consumer he price contract in for Tesla and told me what he was going to do that little spin about. And I turned around yeah. and I was like, I think I can get another 30 out okay. of Goal Zero. All right. So All right. Yeah. Well, we yeah. Just goal Zero. Out thanks out for the... Thing. Yeah. Thanks for the... Thanks for the cash. Um, are they like a consumer priced product? 
it's cool expensive, deal. but it is consumer yeah. priced. Yeah, I mean, uh, you'll find a lot of it for sale at outdoor stores and like from Cabela's to REI's, um, a range from like generator size battery packs all the way down to like tiny foldable solars that you can plug your phone into and shit like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, they make some good products. They, their solar charger that's like a foldable one I use for camping. So I can charge up my um, right. my phone for pictures and shit like that when you're out in the woods. Um, so it's actually quite convenient. When I was smoking my vape pen last summer, I was charging it on the solar power too. And I had this system when I was running around the beach out, at, out on the Pacific coast, skipping on stones, smoking my vape pen while it was plugged in on the sunny side of my backpack. Just, <laughs> just, just charging, skipping around on the stones. It was great. Uh, uh, that's that's pretty good imagery right there. Um, oh, that, man. that that could be the next evolution. That basically, like the Internet of Things, like everything is coming out, con- you know, with Wi-Fi connectivity. Everything should just have solar rechargeability. Yeah. Fucking everything that that uses power should have a solar cell somewhere in it, where you just go set it out in the sun and it recharges. Mm-hmm. Just fucking everything. Your laptop, that, yeah. phone, everything. Yeah, I think that would be really handy. I'll tell you that much. Um, so if we're talking, but I think we were going to speak to the idea of people profiteering, I think, on this. Oh, yeah. Uh, and you'd mentioned something about, Rob, about Trump having ties to the, is it hyd- hydrochloroquine or Neek? Or- yeah, I, I think so. Uh, that I'd heard that he had, like, some investments in the company that makes hydrochloroquine or whatever uh you know and that was the thing he was out there saying like might be the cure and whatever so i did just made me think that and then i knew the story of richard burr the senator and we talked about this like before others as well like yeah they dumped uh a bunch of stock you know based on information they had but before it was public about the pandemic and it just made me think like um conspiracy theory stuff aside like what who else is making money off of this right now where are they just like wondering that piece of the whole puzzle where are they what are they doing are they in isolation do they have the disease are they somewhere else conveniently like what you know um who who are they what do they all have in common you know i'm just curious like that's all um I mean, people have been infamously trying to take advantage of anything like this. That's how I think a lot of people know the Rothschild family, right? I think they do. Yeah. You've heard of that name, and a lot of people have one of the wealthiest families in the world. Children of Roth. (laughs) uh, Individual. They made a big bundle of their money, um, really got kind of started out. Was it like Meyer Rothschild? I think was his, his name. He was in London during the end of the Napoleonic era and convinced, and I, I can't remember the exact ins and outs of how it happened, but he was able to play the relay of information back from the battlefield at Waterloo to the stock exchange in New in London and got people to think that the Brits had lost at Waterloo and Napoleon was going to take over all of Europe and the British Empire might be done. And they divested massively and sold off tons of stocks. He knew that the Brits had actually just won. And so he came in and bought everybody's shit up at fucking pennies on the dollar. And this is in the kind of early corporate eras. It's like 1813, 1814, you know. Um, And all of a sudden he was the richest man, like maybe in the world, like at the end of the day. Uh, But one fucking sinister swoop. um, And it tends to be when we have recessions and depressions that the wealthy... You know, yeah, they're going to lose some big chunk of their value, but then they're going to be able to turn around and buy back everything at fucking dirt cheap and come out of this better than they went in. Yeah, let um, me just uh, il- illustrate something just so our uh, massive listening audience doesn't think that something that Rob just said was some kind of conspiracy theory or whatever. I just looked it up. The Times, the New York Times reports that the president's family trusts all have investments in a mutual fund whose largest holding is Sanofi, the manufacturer oh, of Sanofi Plaquenil. Plaquenil is the brand name version of hydroxychloroquine, 
Associates of the president, including the Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross, have also um, run funds that hold investments into the pharmaceutical fund. So specifically, the the drug that Trump has been lauding as, you know, a great option and, you know, lots of promise and et cetera, his entire family is invested into the maker of that drug. Yeah, right. Yeah, I guess well, you could argue that since it's part of a fund, um, maybe it's less direct or something. I don't know. The fund's largest holding is this company. Yeah. Okay. I mean, Sanofi <laughs> is, is a big one, though. I think it's probably like one of the biggest um, of that like prescription stuff. I think I'm not sure, but it's like Sanofi Pasteur uh, pasteurization. I don't know. There's a history of mm-hmm. that company going back pretty far with medicine. Gotcha. What like, I mean, to your point, Bjorn, and and kind of to the topic, I, the the Daily reported. Um, some numbers today that that highlight that the current situation exacerbates the class divide in America. Um, and there's a really blatant, obvious example of that, which is people staying at home have different types of homes to stay in. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's, you know, the simple, like, super transparent one like people broadcast from home and send selfies and whatever um and some people have really fucking enviable quarantine situations and some people don't and that's largely based on class to your point about bjorn about being able to kind of buy up stocks or like to buy low um to kind of capitalize on the crisis um that's only available to a class who before the crisis had a surplus was working with a surplus, right? Anyone below a surplus is looking at this crisis as holy shit. How long can I last? Absolutely. Right. But the people who aren't looking at this as how long can I last? They're past the threshold and thinking, what can I do to to gain more value here, more you know, wealth, more traction, whatever? That threshold is is not poverty. You know what I mean? Like that threshold is not like that's you know back to the one percent conversation. Um, but that one percent is gobbling up more in this situation. And that's kind of like, that's what we're talking about is that there's a bigger swath of humanity in these situations that get pushed under the threshold, that get pushed down to survival thinking instead of thrive and grow thinking, right? And situations like this, I, I find at least, force everybody to kind of empathize with people who live in this kind of situation. Well, no, yeah, absolutely. And we all know the marriage of race and class historically in this right. country, too. And still, as a metric, one of the most startling factoids that I saw today was some information coming out of Michigan, um, Illinois and, and um, Louisiana, which have substantial black populations. Uh, Michigan's black population is 14 percent. Their ratio of uh, covid cases of was like 40% black. Um, And again, in Illinois and Louisiana, populations of about 30% black and COVID cases were 70% um, black in the population. So because of the continued marginalization of those communities and the poverty that's present in a lot of those communities, lack of access to good health care, built in issues related to everything from diabetes to heart conditions and things like that lead people to have pre-existing conditions that then when you add this coronavirus mix in, the most direly affected communities are the one that have been pushed out to the side and held away from access to resources and, um, and care. You know the longest, and like in in America, that's the black community. Um, 
And and you're also talking about high startling. density living in very Absolutely. low square footage living relative to like per capita. They're like and high density from a neighborhood standpoint. So there's not a lot of um, backyards and you know, outdoor access and local parks and et cetera. And like you just compile all of these worst case scenario features onto subsections of American culture. And to your point is both fi- is both economically and racially divided. Um, and then you contrast that with, you know, a, f- a family of three in a five bedroom house, like the, the type of, of experience that the day to day moment, you know, moment by moment experience of that is so substantially exponentially different than that moment by moment experience in this kind of crisis. And that then to hear like messaging, I was, I was talking to a friend about it the other day to hear messaging of like, everybody's going to get 1200 bucks. And if you file unemployment, Right. The broad strokes of the messaging. Right. You file unemployment, whatever you qualify for, we're going to add 600 bucks a week until June 30th. OK, cool. Everybody just go file your papers. Right. We're just going to go get this money. Um, if you're just say a family of like four or five, you know, three or four kids, a single mom, um, Maybe, you know, one or two of the kids is a teenager so they could work. One or two of the kids is, a you know, over 18 maybe, but still living at home, et cetera, et cetera. This is a situation where you could count heads in your house and go, holy shit, I'm about to have a windfall. Right? I'm about, like, holy shit, if this, if we all file and we all get some money in, we could pay off some debt. We could figure some shit out. We could get some traction out of this. That hope, right? Even if it's kind of far fetched, that hope keeps those people inside that house in this situation not going crazy, not losing yeah. their fucking minds and saying, what the fuck do we do oh, yeah. now? Oh, yeah. But if you take that story out of the equation, and you put five people in a For two sure. bedroom house in a, a two bedroom apartment in Brooklyn stacked on top of a whole bunch of other five people in two bedroom apartments. And you take that story out people and those in streets. In a go, yeah. Oh shit. Who has some fucking money around here? Cause I need it now. I'm taking that shit. Like to me, that's, that's the biggest difference of the class divide is the scarcity and desperation mentality, regardless of the race, is how do you react in a moment where you think you're actually on your own? What you have is what you have. Now let's go. There are so fucking many people in this country that would panic if they actually thought that was the situation in the moment. That's why, oh, yeah. you, that's why New York took so long to shut things down and they still haven't shut down subways. They are terrified of that panic. They, they know that there is a huge enough population that if those people thought that there might be a chance that nobody's actually coming to help us, that we're not going to get our jobs back, that the whole fucking economy is broke and I might not get hired again. Now is the time to start. Shit gets very <clears throat> real in a lot of places. So, in the there's no question that the money is there to keep civil order more than anything. Um, the, yeah, the trick is that it's, in hindsight, the subjectivity of what we find allowable to exist in our society on a day-to-day basis without a virus as an acceptable level of people who are, you know, suffering and, and impoverished it, when we can clearly turn around and print money right um that's exactly. that's what i think a lot of other people are gonna when when this shit blows over they're gonna look back at this and be like all right so who do we owe like who does the government where did the money like let's see the what numbers how did this yeah. actually fuck work out and then how come we're not all getting ubis how come we're not all like yeah if you could send me a check why weren't you sending me a check the whole fucking time absolutely 
Well, and I, th- why I think you ever let my family starve. More than robbery of other individuals, I think you're going to see people take to the street in those situations. Yeah. I think you're going to see Rob major stores. Like, all the fucking like, stores that are closed march. rob them. Well, not. not no, I don't know. I, think I don't protests. know if it's. Yeah, I I think uh, the effect it has on people so universally makes it, in my opinion, less likely. And I think what you're saying, Bjorn, like that people would go rob each other, but more that they'd go, hey, let's band together and do something about this. Because at the end of the day, even if you get his lunch money, somebody else is going to take it from you if it's that kind of chaos. You know what I mean? You're just like, it's if it's totally survival of the fittest, I don't think that's really what people want. If it's, I got to eat, and the only way to do it is to steal this loaf of bread, that's fine. But if stealing the loaf of bread and then someone stole it from you, and then someone stole it from them was the norm, you probably go, how do we make bread? You know what I mean? Because yeah. we got to... Or I'm killing know. anybody that touches my fucking bread because I'm done with this cycle. You know? yeah. yeah. I guess I just think there's, if there's enough people who need have the same need, they'll figure out how to fill it together rather than just sneak it from one another. But if it's just one or two people... Uh, yeah, I then... mean, I, I guess we're talking about two different things, though. You're We're talking... In that situation, we're talking about the 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 crime of desperation right um i'm so hungry i'm gonna steal your food from you i don't care if you starve or not what i'm talking about is the crime of opportunity and crime especially in situations that are usually desperate is opportunistic yeah where if you're living day to day in a relatively desperate situation, your normal breakfast is McDonald's chicken McNuggets. Your normal dinner is a fucking ramen noodles. Then everybody else is paralyzed. Now all those dudes with gold and diamonds are paralyzed. Now I'm going to take the opportunity to level the playing field. That's, that's all I'm talking about is that in high density areas and especially in low economic and in, um, minority areas and where all that crosses over where you've got high density, low economic minority areas who have tons of oppression and live in a desperate state. Opportunity is the emphasis is the starting point for those types of violence, those types of outbreaks and those types of challenges. Right. So like, but to your point, I think at large America maybe takes to the streets or votes or does yeah, you know, other think, kinds of behaviors. I think the I, challenge in highly dense areas and especially highly dense areas, again, are largely populated by people who are in this cross section yeah, of the thing, the thing about this, but I mean, minority, et cetera. But, but like, look like we've been in those, in those, we've navigated those places in this, in this world, maybe sure. not, from the deepest parts of despair or the highest points of wealth. But there is not a whole lot of, I know Jim McDonaldson's worth $5 million and he lives on the 32nd floor of that building. So I'm going to go in there because he's got a bunch of fucking cash sitting around. You think that the people in that building probably got some money, but you also guess that maybe they lock it up real good or who like you don't, the intimacy is not high in those levels, you know, the people in your apartment building and like, you know what I mean? Like I, I, I don't see in the urban setting, the person to person crime really changing a lot. I see in an urban setting, people, some people choosing if, especially if there's like a virus, like we're talking about now, choosing to go outside if they're able to protect themselves and make some sort of display about their anger. And I could also see the next progression going to corporate looting, like stealing from grocery stores or things like that for essential items, needs, um, taking those choice sets first. I think you'd see, in my opinion, and maybe I just like to look at things in a rosy way. You know what I mean? That's maybe part of being a a liberal. Um, But like, I (laughs) I think people would make those choice sets largely more so than they would trying to rob yeah somebody i tend to agree with that too uh but in any case it's all speculation but i totally yeah. agree uh with I, that but it's an interesting thing to 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I, when we say largely, I just want to point out that most of the country is not densely populated like Brooklyn. Right? Yeah, I like, I guess or whatever. So I uh-huh. and but those those super densely populated. I'm talking about in those places. Yes, large. I think that's that's been acknowledged. Like, yeah, that's understood that you're saying very densely populated urban in, areas. In fact, in fact, but to 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 take that like stream of thinking like i think somebody out in milton kansas that probably exists actually um <laughs> which sounds like the johnson family who's been struggling knows that the fucking alfredsons up the fucking block are papered up and they got two new fucking tractors and hella new trucks and hella fucking good shit that they want there, there's a lot more um knowledgeability about where people stand and potential like access and knowledge of like where i go to get to the alfredson family farm i go down you have route some from- great names <laughs> i love it i'm so in this like this is like a I, um oh fucking uh truman capote um what's the what's the book he wrote um anyway uh, like i feel like i'm in a Tr- truman capote novel um, um. I don't know much about him. I'm going to confess, but yeah, I don't either. I just know I should know more. Um, that yeah, I'm I'm aware of my ignorance. The known unknown. <laughs> yeah, conscious <laughs> ignorance. Oh, they say conscious incompetence. Oh, okay. I like that. Yeah. Um, no, I just I like like yeah, all those things are really question marks and like times in America when we've had protest or rioting. Um, that they, they've all they're all such different situations and largely around race like look at um south central and look at ferguson uh just for some examples in our lifetimes of you know larger race related riots and looting situations like that's not what we're looking at with with covid like issues like those were like reactions from communities based on like really stark reminders of what their oppression actually is and like we're we're really particularly motivated uh, based on local sentiment and things like that. And I think you're, what you're looking at here is a factor that's it, it's completely different than that. Well, it's hard in to... any event, uh, you're saying the trigger in your proposed view of things of how it would happen, Meshach, is that people find out they don't get a check. They don't get money. Well, Another well, point is that hope is the thing that's driving people in this situation. I didn't mean to be so negative, but like my point was that when you pull out the hope of having the government and a system that can save people from this situation, um, then things become much more dire. That was that, that that's for sure. Um, and I think on that broad of a level, there's no question that in every instance in every demographic or location, it would be um, troubling if hope was completely lost, which could happen. Uh, but I guess in terms of the trigger event, you know, you said people losing hope through that money not right being something they could look forward to. Another thing that could trigger um, people generally losing hope would be like either infrastructure or um, – what's the word for it? Like shipping and cargo and hauling and transport, like the ability to actually get things from one place to another. Like when those things like inventory of, you know, it's like, okay, there's no toilet paper, but we're being told, you know, yeah, there's plenty of toilet paper back in the warehouse in Milton, Kansas, which is a place by the way, Uh, (laughs) it's an unincorporated community in Sumner County. Oh, that's, that's beautiful. Perfect. I love that they're unincorporated. We got to steal that shit. Yeah. Uh, but you know what I mean? They got a warehouse out there full of toilet paper, right? But it's just not yeah. in the Fred Meyer by me right now. Yeah. And it's yeah, yeah. gone its way and it might take a while. But, and I even heard a trucker call into like NPR or something saying like, you know, they're also very susceptible to getting this thing. And if like it were to spread through that industry, that would have a huge effect. So I'm just saying, you know, there could be other things that would generate a loss in hope. Um, and they all seem pretty reasonably within the frame of possibility to me. Uh, and there's a lot of them. You know what I mean? Like yeah. they could run out of checks because after a certain amount of time, 
you know, they can't keep doing it, right? Or maybe well, they can, exactly maybe they can't. Well, that's the, you know, at some point, they? inflation starts to settle when you're, right. when you're cash pumping an economy. Yeah. So uh, even if it went on for a while, it would stop at a certain point, right? Like, ab- ab- absolutely. I mean, yeah, when it's $30,000 for a hamburger, it's going to, things are going right. to be a little different. It's going to be then. a problem. Yeah. yeah. Well, like one economist on NPR today said, you know, when this started, there was a supply chain problem. Um, that was the, the word I was looking the, for. The toilet paper issue was a supply chain problem, right? There just wasn't enough in stock. We just couldn't get it on shelves fast enough. It'll come fast enough. Like, we'll catch up. Not that big a deal. Now, we're seeing demand problems. We're seeing the fact that people are staying at home means the demand of certain products and certain services are just not there. They don't need those services because they need new services because now they're at home. They don't need those other products because they're not driving to work or at work or doing whatever else out outside of home. They're at home now. So the demand on products has shifted. Yeah. So when the economy sees a supply and demand depletion at the same time, what happens? Right? Yeah, nobody's making that's, money then. Yeah. That's the problem. Like the the supply chain will catch up to things that have a high demand. Toilet paper will catch up. Purell will catch up. Pure water and et cetera, et cetera. That'll be a supply issue as long as there's a demand. The question now in the new economy is what happens to all these things for which there is no demand mm-hmm. anymore? Well, that's definitely a, a question. I think there's several I think the amount sure. of time that things last, uh, there's so many variables, but uh, it, I don't know, man, it's, it's still sometimes hard for me not to, I feel like a few weeks ago, I was just walking, it's like before there was even a total mandate on like staying inside in most places, like I don't think California had done it yet, but it was, you know, the projections and the modeling was pretty public and I was well aware of it. We'd probably talked about it. And I just remember walking outside and hearing like birds chirp and not really seeing anyone around and just being like, man, it's just fucking crazy to think that this could be a situation where everything that's turning off now never turns back on. You know what I mean? And everything just turns off kind of gradually. But what we don't realize in that like timing now is that we're in the middle of something already happening. You know what I mean? Like, and that's, that was the part for me that was like hard to like grapple with. Cause like if the chain of events was underway, it would take a while for most people to realize it. But after a certain point, it would be undeniable, but it would just be slowly in people's consciousness. Some people would start to go, wait a minute, mm-hmm. this isn't going to get better. And then think, more and more yeah. people would realize it until everyone knew it. And you've spoken to that really poetically in the past in regards to like war. Like, when do we know we've passed X tipping point? And right. like, as an example, oh, yeah, World yeah, War one, you know what I mean? When do we know we've gotten there? And like, having those moments, I had one the other day when I went to the grocery store, and like, it was Monday, and uh, everybody was fully masked and gloved. And, and a lot of guys had, had the, had the extra spit shield in front. Capes oh, all over the shit. fucking place. Yeah, um, blankies, and, you know, all spit guards at every register, and like you're like, wow, okay, I was here like five days ago, and this <laughs> wasn't the scene, and now like we've it was already on alert, and we're like at red fucking right. alert now, and it was like, it's, you know, like I think everybody's having their moments with that, realizing that just the situation. And what, whether or not it's a piece of information that you read one day or a conversation you have with a relative one day that they know somebody that ha- you know somebody we know Rob and I know somebody who's had it and has a loved one who's still in in the hospital um, in critical condition and yeah, um, work with a lady who's in the hospital as well yeah. and so it's like man that's um, it's just a really really uncool scene. And, um, it's... and 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 it brings it really so uncool, man. I just chill the fuck out, everybody. 
and it's everybody's um, Ferdinand and Sarajevo at what like in different moments. Like this is all that new war, and everybody's having their own realization that they're already in it at whatever point that is. You know, that's like a cool band, Ferdinand and Sarajevo. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, well. Hopefully it's not like the end of society, I guess, because um, I'd find it pretty inconvenient for that to happen right now. I'm not planning on it or I haven't been, but, you know, it might be that that's what's going on. Um, and I don't know. There's just this feeling, like you say, of having that moment when you just go like, hold on. Like, if this isn't like if nobody's making any money. And everybody's susceptible to this. And the only thing keeping us going right now is the grocery stores, the delivery people, the essential services, the yeah. medical people. But these people are all catching it. Like, yeah, because they're exposed to it. And then there's going to be fewer and fewer of those people. And then it's going to be I'll, harder I'll, and harder to get yeah. things. And nobody's going to They're be not going to want to do it anymore. Yeah. yeah. And you won't be making any new money. At what point does it become everyone for themselves? And that's a point when, you know, I guess the conversation of is it do people go out and hurt each other? Do people go out and steal from stores or both or whatever, you know, like we were talking about comes up. Uh, but I don't know, man. Uh, I'm really trying to just believe that's not the deal. But then boys and brown need to have a little strike and say, if you want me on this job out here risking my life, I'm making six figures. You know? Yeah, but at a certain point, people are going to want... I mean, shouldn't everyone be able to just get, like, the confidence of appropriate testing taking place and everybody having, like, the appropriate equipment? Why the fuck is that so hard to just be like... Like, in a weird way, everyone needs this money, the 600 bucks and whatever else. But everyone could also take some, like... Uh, whatever 95 masks and fucking like Purell and toilet paper like what if everybody got a box with hella toilet paper a bunch of masks like <laughs> gloves, Purell, gloves Purell you know and I'm a just, solar and a, panel and some batteries <laughs> yeah, yeah well yeah. perhaps like a kit you know of just yeah. this stuff is gonna help you like the money is is good too but and even then, it just begs the question to me, like, if you're going to mobilize and start making hella ventilators, okay, but are those people working in the factory going to die? You know what I mean? Because it does seem that anyone that you leave out in the field well, is we exposed. We Like, Bjorn and I talked about that the other day from an unemployment standpoint that, you know, and we've talked about Yuval Harari a lot on this, ca on this podcast, but um, that... Yuval speculates, and, and Andrew Yang's basic thesis was that automation is replacing human workers faster than humans can find new jobs and create new jobs. We need a solution in advance because eventually humans are just not going to be needed in large droves in the workforce. So Bjorn and I talked about the other night, what if this is the impetus that drives that, that the, the thing that gets humanity out of this situation are a bunch of products that are manufactured by robots who replaced all of those humans in their jobs. Um, and then on the other side of this, we now have a manufacturing capacity in our country to create a huge proportion of our products from automated systems and robots in factories. And now tens of millions of Americans are just no longer needed in the workforce. And that, yeah. and the jobs are not going to be recreated somewhere else. What happens now? Uh, three, <sighs> excuse me. Huh. <laughs> uh, 3d print your way out of it yeah exactly yeah that's the answer well and yeah. so you want to know that and... sorry go no 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 no. you you well this is a bit of a tangent but i was gonna say i'm willing uh, okay uh in the united states 1901 people died today 
uh, from COVID uh, for a total of 14,795 dead. So we're the top um, in death count now. We've matched and beaten Spain. Uh, So that's one thing. In New York, 779 people died today for a total of 6,268 there uh, and 151,000 reported cases. In the world at large, counting yeah. cases... A tenth of them are in New York, even of recovered ones. Right, first of all. That's oh, staggering. Also, if you look at confirmed cases, deceased, recovered, and serious cases, it... I'm looking at that website that has all the stuff people are familiar with these things. Uh, the fatality rate across the globe is 6%, the f- based on those numbers. Now, granted, mm-hmm. I think what people always say is since so many people have it who aren't caught, captured in these numbers, it's much lower. But it's interesting to note that in the entire world, it's 6, right? Mm-hmm. In the USA, it's 4. In Europe, it's 9. In Asia, it's four. In Africa, it's five. Latin America, four. China, four. Canada, three. Australia, one, kind of an outlier. Uh, Oceania, one. I mean, I guess that's just Australia and New Zealand and Mm -hmm. Pacific Islands. South America, four. North America, four. Middle East, five. So it's almost between four, five, and six percent fatality rate in every different place. There's, you know, one or two outliers like the nine percent in Europe and the one percent in Australia, but across the globe it's six. So it's just interesting to think that like, yeah, there's a lot we don't know about it right now. But one of the things we do know is pretty consistently that's the fatality rate. You know what I mean? Like right. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, and it's pretty high. Like, yeah, it's interesting. Eventually, we'll have hmm. enough data to get a better idea of that percentage across demographics, across age groups, across you know different types of diseases or you know um, conditions and et cetera. Like, <clears throat> but right now, uh, like I heard today that Wuhan um, has reopened, and their yeah. final final count or latest count or whatever was five percent in Wuhan. Um, I believe it's Wuhan. Wuhan. Man, man, uh, man, y'all! Right. I had a I had a vendor write me last week on Friday, and he's like, "Hey, with this whole Wuhan flu thing going on, just wanted to know if you wanted to still get some products." And I was like, "Do you mean the coronavirus? Because I'm only hearing like bigots and xenophobes trying to call it China China virus and Wuhan flu and shit." Like, <laughs> you want to watch that? And, you said uh, it? Yeah. And he responded back. He's like, well, you know, yeah, I just try to be accurate, you know, about describing things. For instance, the Spanish flu, I think, is a misnomer because there's early cases of that in Kansas. So we should call it the Kansas flu. And I'm not trying to, like, target any particular race or groups. I'm just going for the, you know, absolute most accurate right. terms that I can think of. And I was like, sure. Cool. Yeah, just I. So COVID-19. Uh, Hubei province includes Wuhan has 67,803 confirmed cases, 302 or 3,213 deaths, 64,073 recovered and 158 people serious still. But like, you know, the argument has been, uh, are the numbers accurate coming out of China? You know, right. Um, Let alone anywhere. I mean, that's what's kind of funny. Right. Is, yeah. Oh, we don't trust China. Right. Let's not trust ourselves either. Well, yeah, Over our there. numbers are definitely like there's not. It's not like some. <laughs> we got a great in, track. They are way more flawed than this cast. Yeah, but I mean, what's funny is there's not really an argument that they are like nobody's trying to say. Yeah, we know all the cases. You know, I haven't even heard like Trump say something like that. You know, so it's like our numbers are definitely not accurate. Um, so why then would you think China's would be, you know, perfectly accurate either? Right. Why would anyone's numbers be perfectly accurate? You know, it's all just kind of like 
information that gives you an idea. You know, it's like clues, yeah. but not yeah. facts. Or, I mean, facts, but not whole facts. So we got to end this shit on some up on some like upbeat notes, so man, beautiful. because like we've been on the like on the super morbid tip for like a couple weeks now. It's not just so us, at least. Beautiful. Well, I know, like, but it's yeah, we're 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 on a consecutive run now. Well, we could start by saying that when things get cool, we'll try to do a a field trip to Milton, Kansas. <laughs> yeah, for sure. We need a cast from Milton. Yeah, now, I'd also just you guys have remind down people there. of the glory that once was Radio Shack. That shit oh, was where, dope. Where is Milton, like geographically? Where in Kansas? Sumner. Sumner. I County. mean, like, but where? Where in the? Where in the state is that? Is it's that where you're, John Brown. You're, you're, you're mistaking my knowledge of the existence of this place well, here's with an expertise. Uh, well, that here's goes the beyond thing. My like, scope. Kansas is not a sophisticated state, right? There are two oh, sides you better of it watch that it. The flood cast nation no, in Kansas can be pissed. No, no, no. Let me let me make this clear. Kansas and Kansians, if you're listening, your state sucks balls. It Ooh. sucks Ooh. donkey balls. Your Ouch. state smells I don't like endorse. gasoline yeah, going for and cow shit. Your state smells like gasoline and cow shit I don't, from I county don't to all county. This. Every fucking county in your state stinks, and it sucks. Except Kansas has a one side that butts up against Colorado and it leads you into Denver. And so when you get to West Kansas, it's beautiful, but it's vacant. There's no one around until you get into Colorado. East Kansas, far East Kansas, you get into Missouri and you get to Kansas City. And you get to the little group of cool cities that are right on the Mississippi River. And East Kansas can be cool. In the middle of Kansas, there are cows and fucking gasoline. There's nothing. There's nothing. Corn. So I'm, I'm curious where this city is, where Milton is. Are it's we going to be podcasting from the middle of a shithole that South, should be thrown into Central space? Kansas. <laughs> South, South Central God Kansas. God damn it. Yeah. God That's damn like it. as good as Kansas <laughs> gets. Yeah. That's as bad as it gets. That's in the middle of nowhere. Its zip right. code is six seven one zero six. Good. I have That's offered on the podcast before that we should build a wall. We should have Mexico pay for it. We should build it around Kansas and give Kansas to Mexico. Oh. That would be an interesting arrangement. For sure. <laughs> yeah, that would be. Yeah, uh-huh. I'm sure the Kansians are stoked about that. Come at me, Kansians. Yeah. I'm ready I bet for you it. they will. Dude, on Twitter, every, <laughs> everybody has a following, and Kansas is surely on the list. Um, hey, we're not in Dorothy anymore. We're not in Dorothy anymore, <laughs> Kansas. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, very, sorry. Very Damn, that was a hell of a slip. You like that? It was strong. Uh, <laughs> well... I um, I'm trying to be as cool as Bobby would. I got color ball here. Wow, it's definitely oh, not yeah. quite Rob's huh. level, but it's got some different colors. It is pretty cool though. Uh, oh, purple, yeah, and it looks all white from this side, and then there's just a glow. Yeah, if you don't have your hand holding it on the in like in frame, it definitely has a UFO kind of vibe to it. And especially if it's changing colors. Yeah. Yeah. Which UFOs are, Yeah. Everybody knows UFOs like to change colors. Yeah. All right, guys. Everybody knows that. <laughs> All right. Well, Hopefully well, now that we've society. dropped the real science, yeah. Yeah. If there is, we'll see you next week. Yeah. That's yeah. our new sign-off on the podcast. If society still exists next week, we'll see you then. There. I like that. I like yeah. that. Dude, that's grim. We're going to yeah. cast. I'm going to go back to watching The Walking Dead. Take care, you guys. Sounds optimistic. All right. Peace. Peace.